58 seconds of logos. But really chapter one, right? Because it's a prequel. Or wait, it's chapter two because it happens after Insidious Chapter Two, which was actually chapter one. Oh, f it. That's a pretty nice house for someone whose only marketable skill is talking to dead people. But if you're looking for a reading, unfortunately, I don't do those anymore. The classic I don't do that anymore cliche. Why don't you come in for a minute? Elise doesn't do this anymore, but what does she expect will happen if she invites this girl in? They're just gonna chit-chat and then she's gonna leave? She is obviously determined to communicate with a dead person, so this doesn't seem like a smart move for someone who doesn't do that anymore. You're a very smart girl, Quinn. Um, depends who you ask. No, you are. You read a lot. You have a lot of books in that bag of yours. For a second there, you thought Elise was being psychic, but she's really just pulling a Sherlock Holmes move. Guess you could say it wanted a beer with her just as much as everyone else did. I think this girl just discovered the cure for cancer. Be a super huge asshole so your cancer won't like you. God, she loved old music. Like vinyl records and- Is vinyl records a band? At least needed to turn off that light because spirits are frightened of dimly lit lamps. Lily, are you out there? If she can just call out to dead people from anywhere, is the reading room downstairs just for show? Go away. Go away. I admire how polite Elise is to the creepy demon at first. I'm sorry, there's a reason I had to stop doing this. It's because she is clearly no good at it. Every time she reaches out, she finds some sickly demon or some old lady. If there's other people that do this, you have to find one of them. Elise must have terrible Yelp reviews. This girl clearly should have chosen a medium with a higher rating. If you call out to one of the dead, all of them can hear you. The same is true for the living. Let's say I'm at a football game and I call out Josh. At least 17 guys are going to turn around. Mom? Quinn calls out to the dead member of her family before any of the living ones that are actually in the house with her. Are you there? Doesn't she share a wall with the neighbor boy? Why would she assume any slight noise is her dead mother and not the long list of more rational things to think? There's no food. Didn't you go to the grocery? Yeah. Clearly no one lifted a finger to help her poor dead mom around the house. Was she still doing dishes when she had cancer? Don't want to say she's better off, but I bet the ghost realm doesn't smell like mildew. None of what you just said to me makes any sense. Dopey out-of-touch dad doesn't know anything because he's out-of-touch cliche. Will you just go get your brother ready for school, please? Is she looking to contact her mom so she can take over all the household duties again? Why are we experiencing this extreme close-up around her room? The movie is forcing me to violate this girl's privacy, as well as critique her music taste. Why is it quiet? Quiet's not good. Ironic words he will come to regret? Check. You see this face? This is my whoop-ass face. When and it looks just like your normal face. Dad just busts through the door of his teenage daughter's room without knocking. Good timing, Hector. Now you get to see Quinn. It's the embarrassing little brother trope, complete with blonde hair and smug little face. Creepy senile woman who says crazy things, but will reveal something about the demon later in the movie cliche. Holy sh**, we are only 14 minutes in and they've managed four cliches so far. They didn't want to hire an actor for this part, so they just got one of those cardboard cutouts and put his hand on a pendulum. Which, in retrospect, may have taken more effort than just hiring someone to stand there and wave for two seconds. Holy sh**, where is this theater? Pan's Labyrinth? This is the creepiest theater in the world. Always great. Brusque dude in charge of auditions to throw you off your game trope. I won't ever forget this. When auditioning for theater school, don't prepare a monologue that begins with I will never forget this if there is even the slightest chance that you will forget it. What's going on with this guy cooking? It's not a hot dog stand or anything. Looks like just some dude cooking something in a bucket. Maybe he lives in an apartment nearby and really wanted to grill out and didn't have any of the tools available so he just improvised. Why is it in many horror films the pretty lead is friends with some punk emo supporting character? Do the high school kids in this town just hang out in dirty alleyways with guys cooking god knows what in buckets? There has to be a mall somewhere. At first he seems pretty friendly, just casually waving from a distance, but I'm not sure what his goal is here. Is he trying to befriend her before he possesses her? Seems like it would be easier to just skip this part. Suddenly, a magical car apparates out of nowhere, making a stock screeching sound effect. On the bright side, you probably won't have to take care of your brother anymore. When she dies, she goes to the reverse matrix? The demon really screwed up here. If he wanted to take her soul, he had the perfect opportunity, but he just jump scared her back to life. Now we have to go through a standard possession. Is that a cliche? Yes, it is an important character that adds nothing to the movie, but I don't need you pointing out cliche things also. This creepy bedroom is brought to you by Jack Link's Beef Jerky. Feed your demon side. Everything you like, books. She likes just books? That's pretty general, Dad. What else is in that basket? Oxygen? I'm vegetarian. Well, she's in luck, because I'm pretty sure Jack Link's beef jerky isn't actually meat. I know this is supposed to be scary, but it's actually just hitting too close to home. That's exactly how I walk around in the middle of the night. Maybe the man who can't breathe is just looking for his cell phone charger. This woman has a sad life. She takes two bites of a bologna sandwich in her dimly lit house that hasn't been updated since the early 1900s, then goes to be with her husband's sweater vest. I cannot believe there's a stamped leather journal with his exact image that she uses to write down her visions. Did she happen to find this at a very specific shop one day and throw away her steno pad? You know what book is high on my list not to read after a traumatic experience? A Clockwork Orange. Okay, she's going to text Hector, who she thinks is knocking back, and he's not going to be there, so we know it's the demon. Great. My question is, if the demon is so evil, why is he waving, casually strolling around the bedroom, and properly responding to shave and a haircut? Maybe he's just looking for a friend. Did dude already have those composed and was just waiting to hit send? They came in way too quickly. 
That's the dang it if I was home I could have gotten a hand job emoji. I'm sending this reluctantly, but it has to be done. She's doing the opposite of what a normal person would do when they were just freaked out cliche. Did he just reach through the ceiling? Is that what is happening here? If so, he has really stretchy arms. Every ghost movie makes me question the ghost rules. This is corporeal enough to make footprints, but also reach a giant arm through the ceiling into the room below. Tell me who's gonna pay for the crack in my ceiling. No one is even the slightest bit concerned about the tar footprints or the fact that his daughter was just touched by something. The ceiling should be the least of your worries. I think that was mom trying to reach me. You still think it's your mom? We weren't even five minutes into this movie when Elise said point blank, no, it's not your mother. How old is that lock? I'm pretty sure that was the key Ben Franklin used to discover electricity. Fine. I'll help her. Does being psychic include Dr. Doolittle-like powers? Did the man who can't breathe never learn how to properly walk? That looks like an extremely awkward way to turn left. Maybe it's the ghost of Derek Zoolander. Again, what are the ghost rules? Is it also a pickpocket who can remove things from your body without you feeling it? Hopefully it's not a pervert ghost, but still, Gwyn should watch her bra. I know you're not her mother. The standards of telling which ghosts are and are not Gwyn's mother are set pretty low. So I guess it makes sense that something this obvious to me can only be obvious to a psychic in this universe. Ah, the standard psychic beaded curtain accessory. It must be free with every purchase at Mediums R Us. I know you're there. Is it possible this demon slash ghost isn't aware it's leaving footprints everywhere? <gasps> I can't do this anymore. Too late now, Elise! Right. The real villain, as always, is your internet provider. Anything is scary when it's accompanied by a group of violinists that are apparently playing in the back of a pickup truck that just backfired. He can clearly just appear wherever he wants, but he casually strolls over to the window to shut the curtains. It sounds like they brought in Darth Vader to provide the sound effect for the demon. You live in an old, thin-walled apartment building. Feel free to scream and yell and beg for help at any time, kid. All that walking around and shutting things just to yell in her ear. I feel like he and the people making this movie are just figuring all this out as they go along. Sometimes he leaves behind black tar footprints. Other times he doesn't. Why, you ask? Because f*** you, that's why. Okay, she is comedically incapacitated at this point. Is this poor girl going to be in a full body cast, drinking from a straw by the time this demon finishes? Before, I thought that it was Mom trying to contact me. It, it's something else. Even though the viewer knows the demon is real, her father does not. But from his perspective, his daughter is still clearly troubled. At what point is he going to send his grieving, constantly injured, maybe self-harming from his POV daughter to a psychiatrist? You sure it wasn't just a bad dream? I wonder how many bad dreams Quinn's dad has had that threw him out of bed. People called her the cat lady. Why did people call her this? She never once had a cat, or talked about cats, or looked like a cat, or wore a sweater with a cat on it, or was named Kitty. Or... Why did we do any of that scene? This movie does an excellent job at introducing characters that have no role in the story. I guess without them, the movie would have been too short. Can we just make it a rule that no more horror movies can do long, empty hallways? The Shining did long, empty hallways. They are all off-limits now. If someone told me this was an episode of American Horror Story Hotel, I would believe them. Let's look at the bright side here. It was nice of him to push her down the hallway in a wheelchair instead of flinging her around again. This movie was so close to not containing any needless objectification, but here it is, a sexy demon butt. It's a reverse Lord Voldemort. So far, this demon's biggest crime is f***ing up original hardwood floors. All right, let's take a moment here. How the f*** does this work? I get it, he can walk on walls, but this seems way more complicated than just jumping through the window. Did he step on the wall, try to continue walking, but then fell through the window? But that wouldn't work, because gravity doesn't change. Maybe he jumped from the wall and dove through the window. You know what, I'm gonna stop trying to inject logic where there clearly is none. So I guess he can Spider-Man style crawl up walls too. I guess the jump scare would be a little less jumpy if he was standing horizontally off the wall like his footprints would suggest. That was an amateurishly abrupt scene change. Did he exclusively wear that sweater vest? It must have been strange to go to the beach with him. Imagine the sweater vest tan. Actually, do yourself a favor and don't imagine that. I visited the dark looking for him. I'm looking forward to the insidious six prequel of this gender-swapped Orpheus myth. Something we living people are not supposed to do. I would imagine that we aren't supposed to do any of it. That's how we maintain the qualification to be living people. Classic Elise being easily persuaded to go into situations where she would have to use her talents. When you go there, things come back with you. Is she talking about Walmart? That seems to happen every time I go to Walmart. If we were all about this being a dark place, why would the dark place provide her with a light? And why would it look like that? Whoever does the interior design for the dark place must be really into Japanese culture. She better be careful walking down that hallway. I remember this part. The elevator opens and some patrons of Disney's Hollywood Studios ride down the hallway in some sort of hybrid elevator car before going to another elevator shaft for a free fall. Where is the man who can't breathe? I wasn't trying to upset him. Elise didn't say, that doesn't really answer my question. Does the dark place also have a furniture store? Does the decor change with the eras in which the mediums live? Is it all in her mind, man? How I meet my end. Insidious the Musical! I guess I'm supposed to be scared of this old lady from the first Insidious movie. But since I know how Elise dies and it's not during this moment, who cares? I can't believe they got Jared Leto to play this old woman. I can't. I can't help you. How many times can she not help? 
The repetition here is staggering. We are almost two-thirds into this movie, and we haven't spent any time with the little brother until now. He was a lazy little then he was gone, and now he's all cleaned up and assertive. I think even the non-religious people would give a priest a call before hiring these guys. <laughs> I showed him that one where you guys get the ghost out of that one hotel. Wasn't that the plot of Ghostbusters? I know these guys are phony. If they were real ghost hunters, they would be able to tell that the icing on this cupcake has some supernatural power because it keeps disappearing. She says, one day, eventually, I'm going to die by her hand. Demons are not into spoiler alerts. My gift is all I have. It's all I am. Okay, you're more than one thing. My dice told me so. I feel like Elise could have avoided a lot of heartache if she'd said to Quinn at the beginning of the movie, I don't do that anymore, but my friend Carl does. Here's his number. It's not enough that the characters are nerdy on their own. They also have to wear nerd gear to doubly ensure the viewer knows that the nerds, one of whom even calls himself Specs, are nerds. Inexplicably loud heartbeat noise to build suspense cliché. It's just not fun anymore. Why would the demon worry about placing the hidden, not hidden camera just so in the closet, creating this drawn out moment of suspense? Did he want to give himself enough time to slowly walk around the room again? So why would the demon who has now possessed her break the casts off? What does this accomplish? It is now harder for him, her to walk around. If anything, it makes him easier to capture and tie up. Very useless f***ing father. Are we sure this is the demon talking? And now Spex, who is suddenly no longer in shock or affected by being hit across the face by a wrench, snaps into action to help Sean wrestle his daughter to the bed, while Tucker, who was kicked in the leg, is still lying on the ground in agony. And where did her brother come from? Was he in his room? How did he not hear any of the commotion until this moment? Gosh, he is late for everything. And Elise creeps in during all the moving around. I would kick her out too, because it seems like something terrible happens every time she shows up. It's a spirit who used to live in this building a long time ago. What's the over-under on her making all this up? It's not like she's had any time between causing problems and not wanting to do this anymore to read up on the deaths inside of this particular building. After the accident, it got half her soul. How do you grab half a f***ing soul? Typing would be faster, yes? Yes. C could you just maybe write it down and try not to talk? Are they trying to inject some humor right here? Because I find most of this distracting. Also, what is recording any of it going to do except help these guys with their web series? Take it from me, anyone with a web series is not worthy of being helped. You made you kill yourself. What happened between the Chinese restaurant and now that made her know everything? You're free now. Free? Isn't she still in the further? Or are we talking about free from the rainy nook downstairs? Nothing really seems like it's going well for this dead girl. This is how you die. Not today, it isn't. Always make sure to study the philosophy of Sirio Forel before attempting any exorcisms. Come on, bitch. If that's really all it took, then why didn't she just call her a bitch in the first movie? She could have avoided the whole also being dead thing. <laughs> Missed you so much. Man, she gets real off track real quick. How long before she tells him she can't do this anymore? But I know that my Jack would never ask me to do this. I also know that your Jack would never be caught dead without his awesome sweater vest. And I am very strong. <laughs> so here's a shove. Take that. Demon moves a bunch of furniture and shit around, but apparently can't block the exit. I don't want to rain on Elise's parade or anything, but he seems to be more powerful at shoving than she does. It's got her. Elise didn't stay behind to make sure she got the job done. And now she's not in the further, she's back in the here, I guess. And Quinn is still gone. If Carl were here, none of this would have happened. Lily waits to show up until the very last second because of this letter when it seems like she could have just shown up at any time, making her whole family go through all this mental and physical anguish. Probably need that mask to breathe when you're a demon in the afterlife, don't you? So Lily was there while the demon was also there. So it seems like Lily would have been aware of everything that was happening with her daughter, but chose not to step in until now. Nice parenting, Lily. She's never coming back again, is she? No, Quinn, that's how death works. Also, bummer her brother missed out on the messages of love from beyond the grave. Good job, boys. Good job at doing nothing? Because they did absolutely nothing. You boys fight too much. Did they really need to throw in this manufactured, disingenuous banter? There has to be a better way for them to set up a sequel. I mean, a third sequel. I'm pretty sure that dog has been in the bed for weeks. I'm jealous. I love you too, Jack. But Jack didn't lay out the sweater. It was the final jump scare. Also, what the hell does this even mean? She apparently totally forgets about this by the time the first Insidious rolls around. We know this demon doesn't do anything to her after this, so what a bunch of bullshit. I can hear someone. Is it my mom?
Can I hear them? I hear them in the morning. I hear them in the evening. They're coming into the shower. Sam, what the hell did you do to me? Did you tell every spook in the world you met about me? I got spooks from Jersey coming in here. Wait, master. It might be dangerous. You go first. What? Standing right next to you. What, what are you talking about? <laughs> Good morning, thank you for coming. My name is Dr. Victor Reed. Over the past 10 years, I put together a state-of-the-art research facility in order to study and implement groundbreaking genetic and biological experiments. I'm here to report that on December 2nd, Elizabeth was born. To my knowledge, she is the first human clone. It's what we haven't prepared for that I am most worried about. This is just the beginning, isn't it? Ambition, pride. Tell you the truth, I don't know. I never stop. 